Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. While I'm excited about today's episode, if you've been following our website for a while now, you may have seen us reference a book called The Defining Decade, Why Your 20s Matter and How to Make the Most of Them Now. It was written by a clinical psychologist named Dr. Meg Jay out of the University of Virginia. And Dr. Jay specializes in working with 20-somethings, 20-year-olds. And I know a lot of you who are listening to the podcast are in that age bracket. And the book is basically about the observations and research that has shown that 20-year-olds these days have a lot of anxieties, concerns, worries. And those worries and concerns come from treating your 20s as an extended adolescence instead of treating them as the the time to launch yourself into adulthood. A lot of people these days say that, you know, 30 is the new 20, that when adulthood doesn't begin until you're until you're 30, you can kind of uh, not worry about your 20s. But the research has shown that that's not the case. There are a lot of advantages uh, to your 20s, and if you don't take advantage of them now, um, you, you can, uh, there'll be some consequences later on in life. So in her book, she talks about those issues and concerns, but she also talks about things that 20-year-olds can do now to ensure that they have a fulfilling and enriched career, relationship, and adult life. So today I'm talking to Dr. J, and we're going to be talking about her book, and we're going to talk about um, why 30 isn't the new 20, and what you can do now in your 20s to make the most of your adult life. So listen in. All right, well, Dr. J, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Okay, so you, uh, you've you kind of caused a splash recently with your book um, and your TED Talk about 20-somethings. Um, you wrote your book called The Defining Decade, Why Your 20s Matter and What You Can Do to Make the Most of Them Now. Um, why are our 20s so important? Why, are they, why do you call it the defining decade? I mean, it is the foundation for your adult life, which is why... I like to work with that age group because you can do a lot of good for people getting in on the action early. Okay. And so, well, despite, you know, it sounds like, hey, the 20s are really important. It's a formative part of your life. But it seems like uh, as a society, at least, you know, in the last half century, uh, we sort of treat our 20s as something disposable or, you know, we have this idea that you talk a lot about that 30 is the new 20, that life begins at 30 Mm -hmm. And what right. happens before then is like, ah, it's not that important. Yeah. I mean, why, and that's a, yeah. why, why do you think that's that, a, why do you think that is? Why, do, why are we doing that? Um, this is why we're doing that. It's, a, it's understandable how that came to be. When you, when you think about it, we just need to sort of rethink how, how we're going to adjust to this. But um, really the classic adult milestones, if we think about, okay, what do adults do? Well, let's see. They have jobs. They have houses. They have partners. They have children. I mean, most people would agree they're in charge of their lives. They get to choose where they live, what they do, all that. And most people would agree that's pretty much what an adult sounds like. You don't have to do all of those things or in any certain order or in any certain way, but roughly that's what adulthood looks like. Um, But now a lot of those milestones in terms of having a clearly defined career or owning a home or an apartment or partnering with someone or having kids, these things happen happen now later than they used to. Um, And that's for a lot of good reasons um, because we have birth control now, because women are working now, um, unfortunately, because the economy is not so great now. And so a lot of the kind of classic adult moves don't happen at 21 anymore, they happen at 31. And that is okay. It's actually potentially good. It just depends on what you make of the 20s in terms of the years leading up to that. That um, Fortunately, the downside of adult milestones happening a bit later is that people start to feel like their 20s don't count and that they're not relevant to adulthood when really they remain developmentally um, a, a sweet spot. Okay, so so what are the consequences? I mean, you apart from being a researcher, you actually, you're, I mean, you're a clinical psychologist, correct? So that you that's right. I'm actually primarily a, a clinical psychologist. I'm primarily in private practice, so most of my hours are spent behind closed doors with twenty somethings and thirty somethings, hearing about how their lives are going and and how they're not going. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's that's primarily what I do. So there are there are downsides to 
not to the milestones being pushed, but to how we've interpreted that. And so um, there's a really great quote by Leonard Bernstein that I, I use a lot, and it goes, to achieve great things, you need a plan and not quite enough time. <laughs> So what happens is, I mean, I don't think there's anybody out there who thinks, you know, I don't, I don't want a great life. I mean, people want great lives, but when they hear 30s the new 20, everybody does all that later, adulthood is in your 30s now, um, then they lose that urgency, they lose the fire, they lose the relevance um, in their 20s, and so they end up not making the most of that time. I mean, if if you're going to partner later, you're going to define your career a bit later, you're going to buy a house a bit later, then you have some years in there to do something with that. But people aren't sure what to do with that or they aren't sure why they should bother doing anything with that if everybody says, oh, adulthood's for later. I mean, if you think about, think back to high school or college, let's say you had a paper due um, March 1st, Somewhere around mid-February, you might start to get a little bit worried about it and do some of the research. And then your professor walks in and says, oh, I've pushed the date. It's now April 1st. (laughs) So how many people said, great, I have four extra weeks to work on my paper. I'm going to make it even better than before. I mean, that's just not how we operate. Most people will say, great, I will push this aside and think about (laughs) it in a month. And so that is, of course, you know, the tendency um, for 20-somethings is they feel overwhelmed and anxious and not sure how to get started on life. And then culture says, oh, don't worry, um, everything's for your 30s anyway. So, yeah, just a, you sense a lot of anxiety uh, and I guess, yeah, a lot of anxiety amongst your clients, I imagine. A lot of anxiety. Um, I, you know, the the upside of the kind of the do-it-yourself life now that, you know, we have a lot more choices than we used to, you could live anywhere in the country or maybe even in the world. You could take up a lot of different careers. Have a, You know, adulthood can look a lot of different ways. It doesn't have to be a cookie-cutter experience anymore. And that's wonderful, but the, the difficulty is that puts the burden on the individual to figure out, so what do I do now? And that makes people feel overwhelmed and anxious. And when people feel anxious, they like to avoid the things that make them feel anxious. So they go, ugh, I'm not going to think about that now. I'm going to distract myself or kill time or, you know, whatever um, their habit may be to, to kick that can a little further down the road. And I imagine there's also a feeling of not, not only anxiety um, and a sense of you know, being overwhelmed, but a, like, I'm sure there's like an immense amount of pressure, too, as you approach 30. Yeah, um, you're like I'm. Th- I'm about to turn thirty. I I don't have a I don't have a husband. I don't have a wife. I don't have a job. I mean, and then you yeah. feel like you have to like do all these things um, in a short amount of time. Yes, and so you know, and and necessity is the mother of invention. So I mean, that's that's kind of. I mean, I think the, a feeling of urgency is good. Um, but many twenty somethings. I mean, I've seen this so many times that the early 20-somethings in my office are are stressed and anxious but avoidant. Mm -hmm. And then by the time they're in their later 20s, they're stressed and anxious and panicked um, Mm -hmm. because they can't avoid anymore. And so what I try to do is to help 20-somethings of all ages just go ahead and engage with what's making them anxious. It doesn't mean you have to have a desk job or a briefcase tomorrow, but it just means to take up intentionally what you think you might like out of adulthood. As scary as that may be, you can do it one step at a time, but just to really start to look at it instead of just postpone and then later feel like you may not have the time to get the life you want. Um, So you devoted... an entire section, which I thought was you know, completely fascinating, about sort of like the neuroscience be- behind the twenty-something brain. Um, mm-hmm, this is yes. actually a kind of a new discovery um, because we thought yeah. that there was like a child brain and an adult brain, and that was it. But you're yeah. So tell us a little bit more about that. What's the difference between like a twenty-something brain and a thirty-year-old brain or a fifteen-year-old right. brain? Yeah, a, a lot actually. So we used to think that the brain was mostly fully baked by about eight or so years old, and that's because it had reached most of its volume in terms of the brain size. Um, But as science became more sophisticated and we weren't just looking at brain volume, we were looking at 
connections in the brain, what actually happens in the brain. Um, scientists discovered, not, not me, I was not one of those researchers, but um, researchers discovered that the brain goes through two critical periods of growth. One is in the first five years of life, so zero to five, and you hear about that a lot of that's when kids that you've got to learn to talk zero to five or it's going to be very difficult to do that after. You've got to start learning to read. That's when a lot of early um, development really is laid down in those first, first five years. And then people thought that just mostly grew from there. But they found out that the brain actually went through another critical period of growth, so another big explosion of um, neural connections in the teen and 20-something years. So somewhere around ages 15 to 20, there's an explosion of connections in the brain, which actually leads to a bit of a temporarily a tangled mess. <laughs> but ultimately, um, through pruning, you have a kind of a, um, a new brain. Your brain is wiring itself to be an adult, and a lot of the action shifts from the more emotion-driven parts of the brain to the more reason-driven parts of the brain, such as the, the frontal lobe. So um, this is still going on in your 20s, um, and it's this is new to 20-somethings, this shift to frontal lobe thinking. Um, so what your frontal lobe does is that's the part of your brain that thinks about time, um, and it thinks about probability, and it thinks about uncertainty. So um, this is new for 20-somethings, to not just think about the now, but also think about the later, to not just think about black and white answers, but okay, um, what about all those questions that don't have black and white answers? Like, what am I going to do with my life? Where should I live? What kind of person is for me? I mean, these are really questions that that they're gray areas. They're based on probabilities, not on guarantees. So that's all new thinking for 20-somethings. Um, now, some people hear that science and they think, oh, well, I'll wait until I'm 30 to do something because my brain will be fully clicked on then. <laughs> um, but that's actually not how it works, um, that you get better at thinking in gray areas and at thinking about the future and planning for the future if you practice that. And your 20-something brain wants to practice that. So, um, but it, it's new. So, um, you know, 20 somethings in general are very uncomfortable with uncertainty. They're very uncomfortable with gray areas. They feel overwhelmed about the future. And usually by your 30s, hopefully, you've engaged with that enough or you've practiced that enough that you start to um, be able to do that with a little bit less stress. So, you, I think you talk a lot about in your book how. You mentioned it just a minute ago how twenty somethings are very they have a present bias. Like they're yes. just focused on the here and now. I mean, how does that kind of shoot twenty somethings in the foot later on? Yeah, well, you know, so if we if we go back to what the frontal lobe is doing, so it's thinking about time and probability and uncertainty. So twenty these are new concepts really for twenty somethings. Um, I mean, who mostly have gone through life with semester sized chunk living. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a different way of thinking. So they're more prone to cognitive errors that we make at all ages. But two of the cognitive errors, one is present bias, and that is I'm going to go with what makes me happy now and I'll worry about later. Later. Um, one reason that they're so prone to doing that is they're also prone to optimism bias, and that's the idea that nothing bad's ever going to happen to me. So what happens is 20-somethings are you know, without slowing down and really forcing themselves to think about the future and really think things through, they have a tendency to make short-sighted work or love decisions that, that may not have legs um, because their minds are very present-oriented and they're very optimistic. It's hard for them to imagine that the choices they make today might hurt tomorrow. Mm. Okay, so um, let's talk, I mean, this is a, this is a podcast, a website kind of geared more towards men. So let's talk about this. Are there any gender differences between the problems and frustrations your clients experience? I mean, do men experience their 20-somethings differently than your women clients? And if there are differences, I mean, what's the cause? Is it more cultural? Is it economics? Or are there differences between the male and female brain that might cause those difference in experiences? Um. 
You know, well, I will say this. I have a, a, a PhD in clinical psychology and in gender studies from Berkeley, so I, I have thought a lot, read a lot, taught a lot about gender. Um, what's taught me more than anything about gender, honestly, is two things. One is working with people behind closed doors, 20-something men and women. The other is having a son. So <laughs> I, I think about the experience of being a 20-something man differently than I did when I was you know, a Ph.D. student reading feminist theory, um, that what I see doesn't always match up to what we hear in the media. And what especially stands out to me um, is what a bad rap 20-something men get. Um, Right now, I'm actually not doing a lot of media right now because of my schedule, but I really wanted to make the time to talk to you today because I have a real soft spot in my heart for 20-something men who in my office are nothing like the sort of lazy, no good waste of space that they're made out to be in the media. You know, we hear a lot about that now of Mm -hmm. the crisis of men and what happened to the men. And, and, you know, I see that they're struggling just as much as women, but they just have fewer places to turn with that. Um, And that it it is very different to be a 20-something man than a 20-something woman, partly because you don't have any support um, or it's not culturally okay for you to be struggling as much as the women. Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I can totally see that happening. Um, because you're right, there aren't a lot of places where men can go uh, to, you know, young men can talk about these sort of things. And uh, even if, in the one, like maybe the mentorship that was once there or the community that was mm-hmm. once there for men, uh, a lot of that's gone um, for whatever reason. Um, right. It is really sad. Um, I mean, do do you feel like the men that come in there are they more worried about their career? Are they just as worried about relationships as women are? Is it pretty much the same thing? I mean, it's the same thing, but in a different way. I think all you know, a, a million years ago, Freud said, "Love and work, work and love. That's all there is." And of course, <laughs> there's there's more to, to life than that. But mostly, that's what my clients want to talk about: work and love. And For women, it's different because they feel, you know, a modern woman, and I would count myself among them, um, feel like I could have a rocking career, I could choose to stay home and be super mom, maybe I'll do both, that I have a a lot of ways I could go with this and not disappoint anyone. Um, And I don't think, as much as we like to say that, you know... I don't know that there's no gender bias anymore. Um, I don't think men have quite those same choices, Mm -hmm. that they feel a lot more burdened by the need to work. They know that they need to work to be, or they feel that they need to work and to be successful, to kind of be respected as men. They fear that they're going to work and one day be responsible for a whole gaggle of people like a partner and children, and that, that that's a very real possibility, whereas I think most women don't go into work thinking, gosh, one day I might have to support five people. Mm. Um, but that 20 do feel afraid that that's going to happen to them, that they may not have the equal partner that they're hoping for. Um, so work has a very different um, kind of pressure to it because they feel especially... Um, stressed about finding something good, finding something successful, but also wanting to find something that that they enjoy. Um, So this just, it feels a lot less of a choice for men and still a lot more of a cultural imperative. Mm. Um, In terms of relationships, you know, the 20-something men I work with um, want relationships more than we give them credit for but they're not really sure if they have what 20-something women want, Um, that they see images in the media about 20-something super women who have it all, want it all, or doing it all, and they feel like, well, I'm not there yet. I'm not... I'm not sure that that I'm going to be able to measure up, and um, I hear about that a lot in my office. What do you tell those guys who have that sort of, I guess, status anxiety, is, I guess it's what you'd call it? Um... You know, I do some reality testing or reality checking with them around that those are images in the media, you know, that those are um, images of 
young women who want it all or, or have it all or who are doing it all. But, you know, most of the young women that I work with are also like the young men that I work with. They're struggling and they would be, they don't expect their partner to have it all figured out. Um, they want someone, you know, they can sort of share life's burdens with. They don't necessarily need someone to rescue them mm-hmm. from all of life's burdens or to be some kind of superhero. Um, but it's interesting. Actually, I got an email from a um, really thoughtful uh, male graduate student a few weeks ago, and he said, I just have a hard time believing that some 20-something woman out there wants to partner with somebody who's, you know, working for a pittance and, you know, may not have a good job for five years. And, it, it you know, I felt sad reading that email that, that that's what he thought, um, mm-hmm. that that's what he had been led to believe, because I think there are a lot of women out there who would recognize, hey, a smart, good person like this 20-something man, that is someone I'd want to be with, but he's been led to believe that, that he's not. Mm-hmm. That's, that is really sad. Um, let's talk about, uh, one of my favorite lines in the book and it actually inspired a post that we wrote on the website. I uh, saw that. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was really, uh, it was, it was well received. Um, but anyways, you were talking to a client named Sam and I guess Sam's about 28 and he still lives in the basement of his parents' home and doesn't really have a career. And he comes to you and he says, the older I get, the less I feel like a man. And then you respond... Mm-hmm. I'm not sure you're giving yourself much to feel like a man about. Mm -hmm. Um, And it seems like Sam, I think a lot of young, young men, but also young women too, like they, they feel like as soon as they feel like a man or an adult, then they would magically start doing adult things. Um, Mm -hmm. But your response to him kind of suggests that no, it's by doing adult things or man things, whatever you want to say, uh, that's when we begin to feel like an adult. And do you think, yeah. do you see that a lot in a lot of your clients? They, they have this expectation that they need to feel like an adult before they can actually start doing those grown up things? Absolutely. And, and they have it backwards. So they feel like, I need to feel like a man before I can take on a real job or a real relationship. But you are what you do. And study after study shows that where that confidence that a lot of 20-something men, you know, kind of confess they don't have, I don't have any confidence, I don't feel competent, I don't feel strong, I don't feel like a man, that that comes from experience Um, and that you kind of have to get out there and practice at or work toward um, being an adult just like you have to practice at or work toward feeling or or being anything. Um, So... You know, the longer you stand on the sidelines, especially as you get older and start to feel very self-conscious about being there, uh, the less capable you feel of getting back in the game. And that, um, you know, there's some, a research phrase of that getting along and getting ahead is what leads to that sort of confident, grown-up feeling that people come to in their 20s or 30s if they engage with adult roles. So if you want to feel like a man, you got to act like a man or at least practice being a man. Yeah, I mean, whatever that is to you, you <laughs> yeah. know, and so it's, um, but I mean, it usually means go out and get the best job you can. I mean, most of us need to work, so get out there and engage with it and go out there and, you know, engage with relationships in some kind of meaningful way. It doesn't mean you have to get married tomorrow, um, but it probably means that, you need to maybe go to the next step in terms of developing some relationship skills that might um, lead to something. Okay. Um, so let's. So you, you talk a lot about the book, talking about you know the, the the problems and anxieties of your clients, but then you also devote a lot of time to giving suggestions on what twenty somethings can do in different aspects of their life to make the most of that time. Um, so in terms of career, one thing that really stuck out to me. I know this is really pressing on a lot of 20-somethings right now. It's like, what are they going to do for the rest of their life? Um, You you talk about the importance of developing identity capital. Um, Mm -hmm. What is that? I mean, I've heard of social capital, emotional capital, capital, Um, money capital. What is is uh identity capital? 
Oh, it's identity capital. (laughs) You know, I like, it's not my term. It's it's from a sociologist um, who coined that term, but most 20-somethings have never heard that term unless they're getting a PhD in sociology, and I thought they ought to hear it because I think it's a good replacement for a phrase they have heard, and that's identity crisis. And so I've had so many clients come in and say, I'm having an identity crisis. I don't know what I should do with my life. And they imagine that they should come into my office and think that through for months or years, and then we're going to come up with the answer. And um, I guess, technically speaking, that could be a good business model for me, but I don't (laughs) think I would actually be helping anyone. So, you know, this is not the way that careers happen anymore. Like, that that's actually the identity crisis models from the 50s when people really did kind of pick one thing and do that forever. But that's not quite how it works anymore. So I really encourage 20-somethings not to put all this pressure on making the choice or a choice, but to do things that create choices and to really flip this feeling that their 20s are about closing doors and, you know, narrowing life to imagining your 20s as being about opening doors and widening your perspective. So um, identity capital is just the the idea that who knows what you're going to do the rest of your life, but if what you're doing right now um, says something good about who you are or it's giving you valuable skills or connections or a degree or a leg up, then that's capital. That is an investment in having something else next that's going to be good. So one good piece of capital leads to another good piece to another good piece. It really just means, you know, life is, adult career is going to be a series of moves, and you want them to be strategic and to lead to more and more. Um, my first piece of identity capital out of college was being an outward bound instructor. So it doesn't have to, I don't mean you have to go work at a bank. Mm -hmm. Um, I just mean you're better off doing something that other people recognize or respect or that says something about you that helps you get to the next step than something that, that doesn't, that's more avoidant and not connected with where you might like to go next. You know, trying to stay away from kind of the placeholder jobs Mm -hmm. that people perceive, well, if I do kind of a nothing job, I haven't chosen anything. Yeah. Um, But not choosing is a choice. (laughs) I mean, you're, you're choosing not to be doing something with capital that might lead to more choices. So ways you can develop identity capital, college, getting a, an advanced degree, uh, volunteering like you did Outward Bound, maybe it could be Peace Corps mm-hmm. or Teach of, Teach for America, uh, sure. starting a um, business. Absolutely. Could, you know, that it, it's really, you think about it as your collection of personal assets. So anything that you're doing that kind of adds to that collection of not just to what I can put on my resume, but a lot of times for career, that's what it comes down to. But just, you know, that adds to what you are and what you're doing with your 20s. If you have many clients who know that their jobs are not adding anything, they're not adding value to their lives. And if you know that about your job, you should not spend much time doing that. Okay. So what, what about relationships? Anything that a 20-something can do um, to give them a better chance of having a happy and fulfilling relationship later on in life or now? Sure. Um, Well, I mean, I think one of the milestones that has most shifted is marriage or partnership and that people, I think the average age of of marriage is now about 27, whereas in the early 70s it was 21, believe it or not. Um, And for your more educated crowd, it's it's even later. I got married in my early 30s, for example. But... um, But as a mentor of mine used to say, the best time to work on your marriage is before you have one. And so that means that potentially if you use your 20s by having relationships that are conscious and intentional where you're really exploring relationships as much as you would explore a career, like I'm going to try out different kinds of careers, I'm going to try out different kinds of relationships, different kinds of people, and to see what fits, that... I mean, everybody who wants to partner wants to partner well. And many people say, well, I want to partner better than my parents did or I want to be sure that I don't, you know, I don't want to wind up divorced. Um, and doing, getting married later in and of itself 
doesn't increase your chances of success. It depends on whether you used that time before in some way that um, kind of improves what you know about relationships and what you know about what kind of person is right for you. So, um, you know, I tell 20-somethings I work with that this is the time to explore not just your sexuality, that's easy. Um, the more complicated part is being intentional about what you think you want in a partner um, and to really think through what it'll mean for you to partner well. So use dating as sort of a, a practice, I mean, I don't want a practice run for marriage, I guess, in a bit, in a way. Um, I mean, I think... I mean, I wouldn't give a hard and fast rule of that, you know, you're not allowed to date anyone who isn't marriage material. (laughs) You know, I'm sure people would love to say that's what I'm saying. But um, but I think there, you know, obviously at some point you have to shift from this is fine, this is fun, to what kind of person is actually going to be a good partner for me. Um, And then that that has to be, or it's, it's better if that's a very conscious, intentional, um, process uh, to really think through what is it I want from a partner, not, oh, this person looks good and yeah. everybody around me is getting married. Yeah. <laughs> which, which happens. It, it does happen. I, I, I've heard of that quite a bit. Um, so how about this? Whenever you've written about like, you know, the importance of the 20 something time of your life, um, we always have like guys in their thirties or their forties, like read this thing. Oh, this is great but I wasted my 20s. <laughs> Am I yeah. doomed to a life of mediocrity? Um, what do you say to those guys? Are they doomed or is there like hope for making improvements even later on in life? Right. No, of course they're not doomed. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I do have to say though, I wrote this book for 20 somethings, partly on behalf of the clients I've had, the students I've had who, you know, have some complicated feelings about their 20s. And that it's hard to sit across from a struggling 20-something. It's a lot harder to sit across from a struggling 30-something because that's a harder place to be. So um, it's really because of the people in their 30s who are struggling that I said, I want to write a book for 20-somethings because they're just at the very start of adulthood. I can have a lot more impact on their lives. Um, a mentor of mine used to say working with 20-somethings is like working with planes just as they're taking off. <laughs> and, you know, a small change in course makes a big difference in where you land, you know, where you end up down the line. I mean, obviously, as a 30-something, you're, you probably haven't landed yet. You're, you're on your way somewhere. You may have to turn the wheel a bit more sharply to change course, but, you know, all any of us can do is start where we are. My philosophy is certainly not down with 20-somethings. I mean, down with (laughs) 30-somethings, but it's just, uh, you know, I specialize in 20-somethings because I think so many people said, why didn't I hear all this sooner? So that's what I'm doing. Um, But, of course, all the same advice applies because it's really about the research of adult development. It all still applies to 30-somethings. Um, and we all can just start from where we are. I wish I had started writing earlier in my life than I did, and my first book came out when I was 42, but, oh, well, I mean, better late than never. Exactly. Oh, Dr. J, any any final words of wisdom to our 20-something listeners? Um, I guess my final words of wisdom would be not to worry about what other people are doing or about what other people you know, say that you should be doing or that you should want, even me, um, that living an intentional life is about being honest with yourself about what life you think you might like in 10 years and simply getting going on that. And it's actually a good feeling once you do it. Well, very good. Well, Dr. J, thank you so much for taking the time to talking with us. This is a fascinating discussion. I'm sure a lot of our listeners are going to get something out of this. So thank you Thanks, again. Thanks, Brett. My pleasure. Our guest today was Dr. Meg Jay. Dr. Jay is a clinical psychologist and the author of the book, The Defining Decade, Why Your 20s Matter and How to Make the Most of Them Now. And you can find that book at amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. 
Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And if you enjoy this show and you get something out of it, uh, I'd really appreciate it if you could uh, go on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever it is you use, you use to listen to the podcast and give us a rating. Uh, it would help us out a lot and getting the word out about the podcast and letting other listeners find it. So I'd really appreciate that. Until next time, this is Brett McKay telling you to stay manly. Stay manly.